Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for, uh, I guess, for the first semester of the MPPA seminar. It's a pleasure for me to join as a coordinator for this semester. Um, but uh, it's not about me, it's obviously about Max. So let's just introduce Max. Max, you know, so let's Peter. He's currently a PhD candidate at UC San Diego under the supervision of Dr. Cam Arnold, where he's leading the development of the microwave spin multiplier for the Science Observatory at Severo Tocco and the Atacama Desert in Chile. In addition to that, Max has actually served in the design, integration, and commissioning of all the readout and detectors telling the observatory to fund the receivers. Prior to his graduate work, Mark uh, worked as a research assistant on the design of the dark matter radio pathfinder experiment at Stanford University under Dr. Kent Irwin, where uh, he was targeting axion and hidden photon matter in the micro to nearly electron volt range. And uh, a little bit more, in 2001, Max was awarded a fellowship at Slack National Accelerator Lab to the DOE's uh, Office of Science Graduate Student Research Program. Currently, Max is working on the science analysis software pipeline for the science observatory Pino Research at the Center for Computational Astrophysics at the Flatiron Institute in New York City. And uh, without further ado, let us welcome Max, who will be giving us to talk about the microwave spin multiplier development for the science observatory. So, Max, take it away. Thanks, Fernando. Yeah, so let's get started. So, I'm going to I was told that not everybody's here is a cosmologist, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time introducing uh, the cosmology and the cosmic micro background, uh, the overall overarching goals of the science observatory, and transition into some of the more detailed overview of the work I did on the electronics and detectors. I'll give a background on the sort of state of detectors and readout in the CME field. So we're going to start with a background of cosmology in 10 minutes. So this image uh, is capturing a sort of, on this axis, it's the sort of scale of the universe as a function of time along the x-axis. So we start on the left with this period where the entire, all the content of the universe is extremely compact. And then we undergo a period of superluminal expansion uh, called inflation, where all of this cosmic connected matter is spread uh, to uh, much larger scales very, very quickly. Uh, but at this point, uh, the universe is continuing to evolve and cool, um, expand and but expand more slowly and continue to cool. So at a little bit later time, the first particles are out, allowed to form. So this is uh, leptogenesis and this sort of early creation of quarks and things like this. But the universe is still left in this hot, dense, ionized plasma. So there's just a lot of, uh, there's no atoms. All the particles are in a, in a soup. And photons are just scattering off of free electrons, mostly. So the universe is very opaque. But at this uh, unique time, at around 380,000 years after the Big Bang, we have this period called incombination, where the universe has cooled enough for electrons to bind uh, with uh, neutrons and protons and create uh, neutral atoms, uh, helium and hydrogen. And then the photons in this plasma are no longer just scattered and they're allowed to free stream. Uh, and this we call this this moment in time where the electrons are released from the plasma and call the cosmic micro background. But then if we continue evolving in time, we have a period which we call the dark ages, where uh, these initial uh, sort of distribution of matter and of density and velocity in the plasma, uh, slight over densities are allowed to evolve linearly. And so we're just getting uh, more and more matter clumping and over densities and under clumping and under densities until you have this period called reionization where you have this nonlinear process where you have things gravitationally collapse and you start uh, hydrogen burning again and create the first stars. And then things evolve further and you start forming denser and denser structures such as galaxies and galaxy clusters. And then we sit here today at 13.8 13.8 billion years after the bang. So the CMB sits in this a window between uh, this very early physics where uh, everything was unified, everything was causally connected, 
and we may be able to throw some beyond standard model physics here when everything was in this hot, super hot end state. But it also serves as a backlight to all of the cosmic evolution that happened, so all the structure um, that we have between this and the us. What are sort of the main characteristics of the CMB? So the CMB itself, because it started from this uh, cosmically connected uh, thermal equilibrium plasma, it's a very, very pure black body. It's one of the best black bodies that we have measured. And today it's redshifted to be peaked at a temperature of 2.73 Kelvin. Um, when it was released, it was closer to 3,000 Kelvin. Um, and we no longer have been, this, this data is from uh, really quite old at this point. Uh, we haven't sent a spectrometer to measure the CMB since the COBE satellite in the uh, 90s. And so most of this data was really well constrained. There's still, you know, deviations in parts per, thin parts per million or less that could, uh, you know, which would be able to throw some additional physics if we ever put another spectrometer there. That's not what we really need. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, the other main uh, characteristic of the CMB is that it's extremely spatially isotropic. So anywhere you look in the sky, it looks to be the same temperature down to similar 10 parts per million. So if you subtract this mean temperature of 2.73 uh, Kelvin away, you do see this structure pop out where you see there are slight regions where the CMB is a little bit hotter or brighter or a little bit colder. And these different insets here are showing uh, as time has gone on, these, are, these have been our, our uh, satellite probes of the CMB that get full sky maps. So this is the most recent survey that did this, which is long ago. Did you just say that you have not sent anything to Kobe? We have not sent anything with a spectrometer to measure the, spe the frequency spectrum. So these are, these are measuring the anisotropy, so the spatial variation of the intensity. Um, this had an actual spectrometer that could measure between 30 and 300 gigahertz, and you could sweep and get a measure the black box. So, Planck, for example, is only looking at a small window, or they have they, they have like four or five large bands, so they would be like really large bands within this. So, you could get a gross, but you couldn't really constrain any better than COVID for this stuff. The other feature of the CMB is that it's polarized. Uh, it's polarized through this process called the uh, Thomson scattering, uh, where in the rest frame of an electron, um, if you have a sort of a slight over density and a slight under density in the, uh, the velocity of the plasma, then you'll, you can start with two regions that are emitting unpolarized and the scattered light from the electrons will be polarized. So we uh, know that the CMB should be polarized through this process. Um, the particular polarization pattern that we expect to see in the maps uh, can be decomposed into different bases. Uh, you know, we could choose the two linear, we could choose any two linear polarization bases. The basis we choose is the E and D modes, which is defined similar to E and D in electromagnetism, where the E is a, is a divergence free and the D is a curl sorry, the other way around. E is divergent free and E is curl free. And um, they're sourced by different physics. This is why. The only thing that can source the B modes is uh, primordial gravitational waves or uh, weak lensing, uh, whereas the E modes are, can also be generated from, are also generated from the, just the velocity gradients in the early class. Okay. So then we have all these observables, the spatial anisotropies of the raw intensity and the polarization um, that we decomposed into E and E mode polarization. And then to understand how we can extract cosmology and phys physical parameters from this, this spatial pattern in the sky, we do a basically a power spectrum, but since we're looking at a full sky map, we're doing a two-dimensional power spectrum. So the decomposition is the spherical harmonics. And uh, we get this one dimensional thing because we can basically average over the, the ends. Um, and so here we have sort of different angular scales starting on the left is uh, really large separations on the sky. So a multiple of one would be you know, one half of the sky is hotter than the other half. 
And then as you go to the right, you're getting smaller and smaller spatial separation on the sky. Um, and the other thing you can notice is that we have uh, we have these very big difference in the absolute power. So the polarization signal is much fainter than the intensity signal. And the V modes are much fainter than the P modes. Um, you can see that the E and V modes sort of seem to trace a similar thing, except for where there's a trough here, there's a peak here. That's also important. Um, and the V modes kind of have two signals. So they have a, a signal here, which is the lensing of the E modes into E modes. That's why it traces the same shape. And then you have this little curve here, which is the component that comes from gravitational, primordial gravitational wave. So we'll walk through how sort of this power spectrum, like fits to this power spectrum, constrain the cosmology of our universe. So um, out of the first peak, uh, we basically constrain the curvature of the universe. So is, is the universe open, closed, or flat? We well constrained this with the Planck satellite, and we live in a very flat universe. The second couple of peaks uh, constrain the matter content of the universe. This is also constrained uh, pretty well by Planck. So once you have these first three peaks constrained, most of your traditional cosmology is constrained. Um, so other things we can constrain is somebody was asking about these uh, affected relativistic relativistic species and mass neutrinos. So um, the ratio of the, the TV gives you this number of affected relativistic species, which you would expect to be three, basically three flavors of neutrino. But if we can uh, constrain this to be some deviation from this number, so we're looking for some higher order magnitude precision away from that, that could say there may be like a sterile neutrino or an axion that would have decoupled from the CNB as well. Um, so that's a thing we can constrain. You can also constrain the um, uh, neutrino mass hierarchy. So the neutrinos are have three flavors, um, and they complete three flavor uh, mass states. And they, we know these different transitions between them. But whether they're in this normal hierarchy, which is a more massive hierarchy, than or this inverted hierarchy, we do not know. But if we can constrain the total sum of all the neutrinos, we could uh, distinguish between these two. And the way we constrain that is through this uh, lensing signal, because if uh, if there is more mass in neutrinos, the neutrinos don't contribute to the lensing because they're relativistic, and so you'd have a less lensing signal. And then we have this this part here, which is the big part of the observatory, which is this this peak piece that uh, pops off the lensing tail of the e modes. And this comes from the gravitational wave from inflation. So inflation is this class of theories that predicts um, what was sort of the physics that was governing that rapid expansion at the, at the beginning of the early universe. And we don't know what exact inflation model it is, how long inflation lasted, and uh, constraining what this part of the EMO spectrum would allow us to constrain uh, which inflation models were to govern our universe. Um, so that's what you get out of the power spectrum. Uh, but we don't only observe the CMB, we also observe all the foregrounds. So this is the nasty stuff you have to pull away to get at your CMB power spectrum. Uh, the main point here is that there's many uh, more uh, foregrounds. These are things that emit in the microwaves from our galaxy uh, in temperature than there is in polarization. However, there is a small region here where the CMB is more dominant than any of the foregrounds in the temperature. However, in polarization, there's no region where the foregrounds are not dominant. And so we uh, we observe in these gross bands, we're asking about Planck bands. These, are, these bands called here are, are sort of our gross measurement bands. Because these have different spectral dependencies between the CMB and the foregrounds, we can do a we can, can do a removal of the foregrounds and we have to in order to get to the polarization uh, power spectrum. All right, so now let's transition to introducing the Simon's Observatory. So the Simons Observatory is a large privately funded collaboration uh, spread across 10 countries, uh, over 40 institutions, and over 300 people working on the project. This is our most recent collaboration meeting this last summer. Um, it's sited in the Atacama Desert in Chile, which is sort of on the border with Bolivia, the northeast border of Chile. It's at 5,200 meters and, and relatively easy to access compared to other CMB sites, I would say. 
Uh, this is what the site looks like. So the Simons Observatory is going to sit over here in this unconstructed area, although there has been some construction since this photo. These are previous DMD experiments, and then the background is almost is a very large millimeter array. Um, the reason we observe in this very harsh environment is that it's dry and there's less atmosphere above us, and the atmosphere is also contaminant. It's bright and emits in the microwave. And uh, so we have to, you know, we want to get above as much of the atmosphere as possible. Um, okay. So what are we going to put in Chile? Uh, we're going to put one, what we call large aperture telescope. It has a, it's a six meter cross Dragonian telescope. So that's the, it's two, there's two mirrors, one mirror hidden in here, one mirror here. The light folds into the focus in here. Um, it has a 1.4 arc minute resolution, kind of jargon resolution. Um, we're, and then we're also going to have three of these small aperture telescopes where they're still relatively large, but compared to the six meter aperture, these are 42 centimeter apertures. Um, and the beam is over 10 times larger. So they're looking for different resolution. So why two types of telescopes? So basically the different resolutions allows us to have different uh, scan strategies to cover different ranges of this science space, basically. So the, the large aperture telescope covers this small scale, high L science cases. And really the small aperture telescopes is looking for inflation. They're inflation machines, basically. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing is, I mentioned that the B-mode is contributed uh, contributed from two sources, the lens B-modes and the B-modes. We don't know what level this B-mode B -mode contamination is, but at the level for which we're trying to constrain it, which right now we only have upper bounds, it'll be buried behind the lensing signal. And so we need to do some form of removing the lensing component of the B-modes from the total B-mode power spectrum we measure. And the lap will be able to do a very good job of measuring the lensing beam modes. And so we can we can use the, the lap to constrain the lensing signal and remove it. the stats inflationary flow. Okay, so looking at the large aperture telescope more closely, I mentioned light comes in here and gets focused into this receiver cabin. This receiver is very large. I'll show a picture. You can humans can stand in here. Um, so everything that we operate is cryogenically cooled down to uh, our detectors are, are ultimately operating at 100 millikelvin cooled by a dilution refrigerator. Um, but we have these big windows that have to let in the microwaves in. So we have to we have to you know not have too much IR heating so that we can keep everything at 100 millikelvin. So we have this kind of Russian doll that's common of wall cryostats where we an 80k 80 kelvin cooler that that cools some filters and then a 40 kelvin volume and then a four kelvin volume and then ultimately everything is focused around these elements here which are where all the optics sit most of the rest of this is just cooling infrastructure and bringing in the real energy so um each of these units in the middle are what we call optics tubes so they house three uh lenses that uh focus the light here onto this uh, focal plane structure. Um, and all the all the, the entire optics tube is cooled to one Kelvin. Uh, and so uh, that, that allows us to have very little um, background photon loading from the, like in the microwaves from the actual telescope itself. Um, these optics tube, the way that we do this, uh, different frequency bands for foreground subtraction is that each of the optics tubes gets two different frequency bands. So they're dichroic pixels. So they're, they're split between this low frequency, mid frequency, and high frequency bands. So there's going to be this distribution, you know, four, three, four, two, one. So there will be seven populated optics tubes, each at different frequency bands. Um, this is a picture of this fully wretched. We were watching the video of them getting assembled. This is the, the team there. This this was mostly led at N, uh, the large aperture telescope assembly, uh, quite large and to be booked. Um, the survey strategy, which is targeted at these uh, small scale, large emission, 
uh, is aimed at covering just as large of a fraction of the sky as you can access from Chile, which gets to you know, about 40% of the whole sky, has very large overlap with uh, optical surveys, which as you can sort of see from this, these are some of the science parameters that are related to constraining that I was talking about constraining the cosmology. So it's primordial uh, non-Gaussianity, which we mentioned before, uh, the, the number of affected species, uh, those specific species, some of the neutrino masses, and then this is uh, sort of structure, formation, and evolution. But what you can see is that uh, a lot of these, the constraints are not just driven by seeing these measurements, but with cross correlation with optical surveys. So LSST and DESI are, DESI DAO are both optical surveys. And so the overlap with these is, is important. Um, but really, this instrument is going to be larger, uh, as good a resolution, but way more sensitivity than we've ever had on the sky for this sort of, sort of instrument in the field. So we're going to make kind of a leap in. Uh, factors from two to 10 in kind of every single science page for this instrument. Sure, could I ask a little quick question? Sure. That 40% was 40% of what? What is going to uh, The CMB is coming from everywhere. So when you're in a satellite, you can map the entire sky, but from the ground, you're blocked to only access some fraction of the sky. So where we are, we're at a good latitude where we can see a, a, a large fraction of the sky. That allows us to, does that make sense? Like 100% of the sky would be four pi gradient. So, uh, so this is 40% of that. And, and so with that map, color, colored part of that map seems to be larger than 40. Yeah, it's just, just a projection. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that was one, and the other was with what part of it is that 100 milliseconds? Is that something is that 100 milliseconds? Um, the, the detectors. Only with the detectors. The detectors. And the optics sit a little bit hotter at one thousand, but most most things are cooled. Uh, the, all the coldest read electron. The stuff that I work on that I'll talk about later as well. Thank you. Um, all right. So then the the smaller te aperture telescopes, which I mentioned, there are three of. We're actually building four, but at any given time, only three will be observing. The four is to cover the different frequency bands that we talked about. So we're going to have the two, the 90, the reason we put more at 9150, that's where the CMBs peaked. So we're getting more sensitivity at the CMB wavelengths. Um, uh, but in general, this is also going to be like a big increase in the total number of uh, detectors that we get on the sky, which uh, I'll mention later, but that just directly relates to raw mass and detail. Um, so each of these sort of cylinders which looks sort of silly in the rendering, uh, house in the middle of this structure, which is a platform that allows for as L pointing of the telescope. And within that structure, within this little structure, is the actual telescope. So when I say it's a, a, a refracting telescope, it means that there's no mirrors. So all we have is this is the window, and we collect like a bucket from the CMB. The light comes in through a window. We have what is called a, a halfway plate. So this is a thing that, that is a has a levitating bearing uh, that rotates magnetically uh, through a magnet mag magnetic rotator. Um, and it's a birefringent piece of sapphire that modulates the polarization, incoming polarization of the CMB at the rotation rate times four. So, so we end up getting this the polarized CMB signal uh, at eight hertz. Um, Roughly, uh, not, that is a, a way to mitigate a lot of systematics related to low frequency drifts in the system. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to observe that 27, 39 kilometers um, from Chile? Yes. Yeah. So if we go back, that's a lot of animation. Yeah. So these are basically this is what the atmosphere looks like. This is the transmission of the atmosphere. So you see there is like these windows. All of our bands are just based around these windows. So actually, it's relatively clear here. The harder place to observe is actually the higher frequency bands up at 270, like 300. So we fit in our CMB bands fit kind of in here and in here, straddling this line. And then our two high frequency bands sit in this window, and then the low frequency bands fit in here. Okay. So this is the transmission, but really the emission of the atmosphere is the kind of just follows this essentially. I mean, the, the foreground there should be pretty strong, right? Yeah, that that that's the entire point is that that channel is just monitoring the synchrotron mission, which oh, is the okay. dominant foreground. So that's that those channels just allow us to like constrain synchrotron and move it from the CMB. They're not actually really picking up that much CMB. 
good question. Um, right, so light comes through this halfway plate modulator, and then we have again three lenses that focus onto the focal plane. All these lenses are cooled to one Kelvin. All of this structure in here is baffling uh, to make sure that you're really only seeing a one Kelvin volume uh, that just corresponds to the background loading our detector seat, which just translates to higher noise. Um, and then in the back here is all, all the readout electronics that get fed out. Uh, so there's some coaxial through the ports and things here. Um, and then there's a lot of multiple, multiple layers of magnetic shielding, which is really hard in this kind of structure because we have to have this huge opening. And if you want to do magnetic shielding, you don't want a huge opening. So that was a, a complicated design to come up with. Um, but similarly, this uh, Russian doll sort of thing, uh, same thing to the LHR, the different color coding, getting me down into this 100 milliseconds volume. Um, the small aperture telescope was commissioned, the first one at least at UC San Diego. So I've been very involved in this instrument. Um, this is uh, it's our knee to your ear and fully, fully commissioned instrument. Um, and we, we're currently uh, working on the, for actually for all these instruments, it's like the final uh, in lab commissioning run before they deploy to LA. Uh, this instrument, like I said, is the B mode search. Its primary goal is measuring inflation. Um, and so the way that we do a survey looks very different. We're only looking at 10% of the sky, but we're very, very deeply going into that 10% of the sky. We're getting a fairly small, a much smaller patch, but very, very deep. And it overlaps with previous surveys that have done this same sort of measurement. So uh, biceps and spiders mostly. Um, this region is also, uh, this, this bright thing that's in the background is the galaxy. That's where most of the foreground emission is from dust. And so we chose a region to minimize uh, for them. Um, now, I, I sort of walked our way through how the photon gets to the focal point, but my next sort of uh, discussion is going to be talking about the sensor. So somehow we need to talk about how we collect, uh, you know, the microwaves from the sky onto sensors. And so what we have is these coupling feeds. So the, their whole goal is to convert a free space wave into a, 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 a guided wave and a, a wave that. So they take sort of a, a planar plane wave here and convert it into a guided wave. And we have two structures that we use. We have a profile horn and uh, a lens lift. The profile horn couples to be like an orthomotor transducer. So you can see these two crosshair dipoles. They both pick up a single polarization. And then you have on ship band defining filters that set the two dichroic bands. So each of the polarizations is split into you know, one of the two bands. Same thing happens here, although the antenna structure is this sinuous, funny looking thing. Uh, but that is also dual polarization. The reason we do this is it's a much broader band antenna. These two have different systematics, so they'll allow us to you know, tease out systematics related to one piece versus the other. Um, I'm not talking about the detectors yet. <laughs> I will talk about the detectors in a second. The, so they get, let's just say they get dumped to like a power meter, and then I'll talk a lot about that. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, there's also a lot of exciting, what we call non-primary science, which I know is just what we propose the project is supposed to be versus, we can do a lot of other really cool stuff. Um, so, we will definitely have, we'll be making these daily maps of the CMD. So we can look for um, transients in the millimeter. And we plan to have an alert system where we'll send an alert every time we identify a transient in the map so we can do follow up surveys. Um, we'll have this huge collection of millimeter galaxies and a lot of maps. They'll be made publicly available with a lot of code. Um, and we're encouraging joint analyses with other surveys. And at least in the lab, we're covering a lot of the galactic plane. So even though we're trying to avoid foregrounds, uh, we will also be measuring things about the galaxy. Uh, okay. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about the detectors. <laughs> so we're in this limit, what I keep focusing on the detectors a lot is that our, our instruments is in this limit where we're photon noise dominated, which means that the noise of the sensor is completely dominated by the shot noise of the arriving photon. 
So we're, it's the emission from the, the atmosphere and the instruments you see in the and the foregrounds. Uh, the noise of that is just totally dominated the sensor. So in that limit, the only way to get higher map depth is to increase the number of detector year, time years, basically. And if you have a given instrument with a given number of detectors, which is what this is trying to show, like a different line, it's like a different number of detectors for a given instrument, you relatively quickly like saturate the sensitivity of your instrument. And the only way to get a higher sensitivity instrument is to jump in the number of detectors. And so, so the big leap that SO is doing is an almost factor of 10 or so and lock increase in the number of detectors. The type of detectors that we use uh, in order to um, be photon noise dominated are transition edge sensor barometers. So these are uh, a superconducting film that's operating right on its transition between a normal and a superconducting metal. So this uh, is an illustration of the resistance, the function of operating temperature of the film. Um, and in this structure where we have a weak link to the back that's providing some cooling to the island, and we have this voltage bias on the film that, are, that provides some electrical heating. We can keep it in a feedback loop that keeps us right on the superconducting edge, where a small change in temperature in the island corresponds to a large change in resistance, which we can read out through the change in current. Um, so a little bit of CMB light will, will be absorbed from the waveguide onto this structure, and then that will slightly increase the temperature of the film. And we'll get a big change in resistance if we do that. Um, the, the sensors themselves are very, very low impedance. So they're 10 milliohms to one ohm or so. Um, and they uh, and so we basically need an ammeter with very low impedance, very low noise. Uh, and so basically the only way that we know to do this is with the superinducting quantum interference device or SWID. Um, so we, we put an inductor in series with the loop that's biased in the detectors, and the flux from the inductor is coupled into the squid. Uh, and we measure the squid itself has this, uh, as a function of flux to the squid, you get a differing output voltage. And again, we can apply a feedback loop to choose a point where a small change in flux corresponds to a large change in output voltage, and, uh, and use it as an amplifier in that way. Um, but in order to get large numbers of detectors, we need a way to read out many squids and many detectors uh, on fewer readout lines because uh, many, many wires going down the bias detectors and readout squids uh, increases the amount of uh, just thermal conduction through the wiring to the coldest temperature stages. So it's hard to cool the focal cone mass. It also takes up space where you can be putting precious detectors and it just increases the total complexity of the instrument. So we, we use a type, we use a, a multiplexing where we can read out multiple sensors on, on a few, few number of lines. The two main ways that they're done, that, that are used to do this are either time division multiplexing or frequency division multiplexing. The general scheme is you, you, you have to take, you have to basically encode your detector information into some sort of orthogonal basis set. And time division multiplexing, you're sequentially addressing detectors, sort of like a CCD. And then the inverse is just reading the sensors in the, in the time order. The frequency multiplexing, you're encoding them in individual sign nodes. Um, so we, in, in most of my PhD, have been in development of this microwave squid multiplexer, which is a form of a frequency domain multiplexing. Um, so I'm going to walk through how that works. So with a frequency, with a microscope multiplexer, you start with a high quality, narrow bandwidth notch filter, uh, capacity coupled to a feed line. So, uh, this defined in, in transmission, this is a, a very narrow location region where all the power coming in will be reflected back um, and very little will be passed through. And that that's defined to a very new frequency. Then, if you terminate that structure, that, that frequency defining band structure with a squid, um, inductively couple of squids to it, it makes the notch filter uh, flux tunable. So now the frequency of that notch filter changes as you change the flux. Then we can connect a transition edge sensor barometer to the squid so that now signal from the TS corresponds to frequency shifts in the notch filter. The squid response itself is this periodic response, and we needed a way to linearize the response. 
So we apply this ramp signal. And then the structure is generalizable to many, many, many uh, sensors. So this is the multiplexing. So now you can have many narrow notch filters on a common microwave feed line. And this scales up to order a thousand or so sensors on a single pair of uh, the options. So I'm going to walk through what these look like uh, in a plot and sort of schematic. So, um, so the single notch filter in frequency space looks like this. So we've selected a narrow, a narrow frequency. And when you couple the squid to it, the y-axis here is flux threading the squid, and then the x-axis is the frequency of the notch filter. So it follows this cosine curve, which is the half here, the cosine. Um, then when you couple a TS to it, you start having the frequency shift proportional to the signal. So this is like a time order data looking at a Jupiter. Um, and then I'm talking about this linearization, linearization scheme of this grid. So because uh, we're applying a ramp through this common line, uh, the squid, the notch filter is continuously being moved periodically between a minima and a maxima in this uh, periodic order. Um, in each ramp frame, you get some number of periods. And then if you have a little bit of extra signal from the sensor, so in this kind of schematic plot, we're just doing a VC level in the sensor, you get this small phase offset. And so the signal then becomes the demodulation of the, of the frequency modulated signal, basically. So you're looking at what is the phase shift of that continuously uh, moving resonant uh, notch filter. And then in transmission, when you have thousands of these together, it looks like this sea of things, and each of these are individual notches. So this is now all of these will be moving with the sensor, and we're we can read them out all all the all that's the micro signal. Um, okay, so let's go through the overview of the design. So when we started DSO, we knew that we needed to make this big jump in number of detectors. We decided the micro squid multiplexer was the only make, way to make a big leap relative to previous generations. But at that time, the only thing that had been generated that had been demonstrated with the micro multiplexer was this relatively small focal plane called the Mustang Q, where there was only about 64 chips. The noise was not very good. The, the telescope itself had much higher sensor noise, so the requirement on the, the noise from the multiplexer was much looser. So we knew that there was a lot of challenge with this data. In particular, no room temperature electronics existed to actually interrogate thousands of notch filters simultaneously. Doing that with sufficient linearity when you're putting many, many uh, tones and you're hitting some devices with finite linearity, like how do you do that? We thought that would be a problem. Having a multiplexer design that's actually matched uh, all the requirements of our particular experiments, that, that needed to be demonstrated. And then packaging with this all in the high density such that we really can achieve the high focal plane density that we want. So we had a lot to overcome with the project, but I will hopefully we can do that with them. So, um, right. So the first problem I presented was this linearity problem. So imagine we're putting just two uh, microwave tones to interrogate these resonators, these notch filters. Uh, if you have a nonlinear device, uh, the output of that nonlinear device will not just have the two input tones, but some spectrum of output tones. So we'll get this, this second order nonlinearities end up at uh, sums and differences, and then third order nonlinearities end up at two sums and differences. And in particular, these ones here are quite pesky because if you design your system to stay within one octave, such that the highest frequency is no more than twice the lowest frequency, then you can ignore all of these because they end up outside of your band. But all of these fall within them. And the number of those tones scale like the number of the number of tones you put in cubed and the power cubed. So very quickly it becomes a problem. If we demonstrate at 64 channels and it's fine, there's no guarantee it will work at a thousand channels. It would scale very quickly. So the way we solve this was we split our amplification into two, two stages. So the low, so it had lower gain, but much higher linearity um, in, the, in the first stage. And then the second stage amplifier had lower gain, but much higher linearity and everything worked out much better. We ended up with about 
can be the entire linearity of the fire chain. We did this trick of keeping all everything within one octave so we didn't have to worry about uh, these sorts of mixing products or these sorts of mixing products. And then we implemented this tone tracking for a while, which I'll mention in a minute. So uh, the second challenge was a set of electronics that could interrogate thousands of tones simultaneously, thousands of notch filters simultaneously. And what we came up with was this black micro resonator RF electronic, which my time at, at Slack that this DOE fellowship was working on commissioning this and I was understanding it. So um, it's a FPGA board that generates all these tones. It does a lot of things. <laughs> um, it can generate up to 3,328 tone, individual interrogation tones in, in 40 hertz of bandwidth. With all of those tones on, we achieve this 100. And you see what that means is if you look at the peak of one tone on the spectrum analyzer, and you look at the noise score relative to that, and all the other tones are on, the noise is 100 decibels below the peak height. Um, that was a requirement for the, the noise of the instrument. And then we also have all this boring stuff that's incredibly important for the experiment, like timing synchronization and uh, DC biasing and streaming data at high data rates and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then we have this thing called tone tracking. So the firmware that generates all these tones is actually a that knows the ramp signal we're sending in. So as the notch filters are moving periodically, um, all of the interrogation tones are moving with the notch filters. And so the transmitted power is only the power at the minimum of the notch. If you are moving off of the minimum of the notch, more power will be transmitted to the amplifier. And then the linearity requirements will make the same go up. So this is demonstrating when we have the tracking off, you see the power transmitted through the system is, is oscillating as the resonator is being stepped in flux. And when you turn the tracking on, it's flat at the minimum. Then we had to come up with a multiplexer design that would uh, satisfy um, some key requirements. So basically the notches need to be deep enough. Uh, that just directly translates to the noise at the end of the system. Uh, we needed high yield, so we needed uh, many channels that landed in the bandwidth we care about, um, that had these deep depths, all that kind of thing. We needed low cross talk, um, which we set this requirement at 0.3% based on some simulations. Uh, and we needed low frequency scatter. Um, so this, this basically was demonstrated not that long ago, in 2021. Um, and it, and it basically showed that we settled on a chip design that had the crosstalk and over a gigahertz of bandwidth, we got all of the frequency scatter, dip depths, all the sorts of things that we carried about for the notch filter. So we locked in the multiplexer design. And then we had to come up with a high density package that would work for our application. So this is the previous generation packaging uh, with 64 and 40 channel multiplexing. Um, and you can see in this case, they're taking up a lot of lateral space in the focal plane. So only this area in the middle is where the detectors live. And all of this area is being used for the readout only, where there's no detector. If you want more pixels on the sky, this is bad. So uh, we wanted to move to something that didn't use lateral space. We also didn't want to take up a bunch of space behind because we needed all that space for cooling and optics. So we ended up with this very compact design, which is very hard to achieve, mostly because getting good microwave environment on a large chip scale like this is very difficult. But let me show you that we actually achieved our noise with performance that we required. So with this final packaging uh, multiplexer chip and using the, the new readout that we developed, um, we measured a fully integrated system. And what we have here is the, uh, the individual readout noise contribution. So just from the multiplexer system. Um, compared to what the noise from the sensor is going to be from the sky. And the fact that it's uh, everything falls way below means that we're totally dominated by the sky noise. And so we've achieved a high multiplexing factor while still maintaining this uh, sky noise dominated operation. This uh, was basically recovering the sensor parameters like the transition uh, temperature, the thermal conductance, the normal resistance. Uh, what that told us was that basically uh, the dynamic range of the VR system was working properly because we were recovering signals over a large range of operating uh, signals. Uh, 
So um, we got to this state, uh, and along the way, I had been working on this noise modeling, uh, which we made a lot of progress on, but ultimately we achieved the final uh, modules without a full understanding of the detailed noise contributing to the system. We did a lot of empirical studies and we found that we got a design that met the, the, the requirements of the observatory, but what each component of this highly complicated system, how did each of them contribute to the total white noise level of the readout, we did not know. So I'm not gonna go into details of all of this, but basically the model is a bunch of inputs in yellow. So different key components, which are grossing over a lot of details. Uh, and then in blue, how you transfer through key components of the system to ultimately refer everything to noise relative to the sensors. Uh, to understand if you were to redesign this for a different application or a different experiment, uh, how can you tweak the couplings and the levels of noise in different components and still come up with a sensor dominated experiment? Um, so we have done this and it sort of works uh, to a decent level. Um, there's uh, this, this plot is showing over a wide range of operating powers of the different uh, sensors, all the different contributions of different noise sources. The different lines here are different components that I highlighted in yellow in the previous slide. The purple is the sum of all of them. And then the stars and hatches are different measurements that we made on the, on the real system. So we have some population that's matching and some that aren't. And what we're kind of doing now is tracking down systematically what is driving the variation. Um, but we have a model that is we're working with other folks that are actually using it now to try and think up a new experiment. But along the way, we found that uh, we found a coupling to the environment that was not such a concern in the lab, but is definitely a concern when we deploy to the field, uh, which is that the, we, we found that the physical length of the cables um, that go from the cry step to our alarm readout their physical length changes as a function of temperature in a, no, a non-negligible amount of way over the over the temperatures that we see at the site. So like, you know, microwaves are some millimeter wavelength and we're seeing fractions of phase changes that do ruin our calibration. Uh, and so what I'm showing here is sort of expected level, like we know that the cables have some temperature coupling, right? That you can extract what that is. We see it was completely consistent with the cable coupling. Um, and then what we found is basically we, what we want is we want to measure like basically S21 is the effect from the resonator frequency shift itself, the amount of phase change that the frequency that the, red, the notch filter uh, gives itself. But what we end up measuring is some sort of mixing with the table shift. And so it looks like a leakage that we've done. So what we did was instead of driving the phase change from the environment, what we also did. Uh, we added an analog phase shifter and uh, we added a set of extra monitoring channels at locations where there are no resonators. And we use those to monitor the background phase. And then knowing how much the background phase is changing as a function of time, you can remove that mode from the, the contamination of the sensor channel. So what this is showing is our monitoring channels. There are at locations where there's no notches very well following the phase that we've injected periodically in this slow time scale. In the blue here is one of our actual detector readout channels being contaminated by that modulation. The green is a same length of acquisition, um, but with the modulation turned off. And then the orange, which is behind the green, or they're kind of transparent, is after I've cleaned out the contamination from the detector signal using the monitoring channel. And so we now have demonstrated that it does follow the temperature. We can monitor it very well and we can clean up the signal. So this is now something that we can employ. And this is a lab test. This is a lab test. Uh, we don't have anything in Chile yet, but we do have like lots of measurements of the temperature in Chile. And so I could uh, estimate the level of this day and night cycle because I do. I don't have plots here, but I did like we did have tons of thermometers pasted everywhere and found the lab temperature changing 
and put the plants and all sorts of stuff and could totally see it directly following. So then I could just directly expect the temperature coefficient, temperature variation at the site, how much is this leakage going to be? And this is roughly the right level, like 10 degrees over a sort of the, the largest day night cycle, 10 to 20 degrees. Um, and so I injected something that's like roughly the right um, it's probably a stupid question, but can you just break all the table in a uh, weather control room or something? Yes, to an extent. Um, but uh, yeah, to an extent. There's uh, lots of constraints from our site um, that don't allow us to just be in an air conditioned room. Uh, so we do some amount of like environmental shielding. Um, and so part of this is not going to be mitigated by my monitoring technique. Part of it is going to be mitigated by we bought a better set of tables that have lower temperature coefficients. Part of it is going to be uh, hoping that our environmental shielding doesn't, like we don't have the full temperature thing that we would have if we we're not in the shielding. Um, but this is sort of like the third trip in the balance. Are, are your tables top one? These are Teflon, which is what's the worst. This is the worst, exactly. Well, yeah, and then we tested a number of tables. Well, I, once I found that this was a problem, I realized we were using the worst possible. <laughs> and then we uh, found better tables, and we ended up somewhere in the middle because we can spend a lot of money on big table tables. So we ended up somewhere better than Teflon, but not like the best thing we saw. Um, that's mostly the end of my talk, and I like start people start asking questions in good because this is about when I just wanted to end. How the whole videos. So, we're first light for the instrument comes in 2023. Uh, so, this basically this coming year. Um, and really, this instrument is sort of the premier instrument for CMB measurements, both at high and low angular scales. For the next five years, probably. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, so it'll be the next, like there's there's a next generation experiment, but we're we'll be operating for many years before it. So I have a pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so already this is the construction of the platforms of the small object telescopes. This is the full platform for the large aperture telescope being moved all the way through its scan strategy. And this is like a building size structure that we've demonstrated we can point to really a high precision accuracy. So we really have all the pieces together. You saw the pieces in the lab. And we're kind of in the last you know, five yards. It's a hard part of the project, but we're getting, we're getting there next year. We overcame a lot of challenges just to get this microscope multiplexer, which is a key component of like the observatory operating at full operation. We, did that in a sort of a five year development process. And uh, we're still working on figuring out some of these 20% level issues in our noise model, but um, we're already working on expanding applications to other experiments and using the multiplex. And that's all I have for my formal talk. Well, thank you, Max, for this uh, very, very nice talk. I'm sure that everybody here enjoyed it. There's been questions already here on the inside. So uh, first, I want to see if anybody on the outside has any questions for Matt. I guess you can just raise your hand and type it in the chat. OK, so uh, if there are no questions on the outside, somebody in the room that wants to ask something like this. Yes, this is probably not clarify your noise this way, but uh, how many photons does it take to really? How many? What's your photon sensitivity? It's many, many photons. Yeah. Like in our in each resonator, we have like a million photons. Like it's really, really high drive powers with relatively strong couplings. So we're like super far away from the sort of quantum readout limit where you would have single photons in the. Yeah, I'm just asking because. I tend to always calculate something in terms of number, number of photons you get out of things. And, you know, for example, you look at axions from mag stars, you can in there and sort of know the rate of photons out of that. And, you know, you get a very sharp signal frequency. And uh, in principle, you could look for that kind of thing. 
the system if you make sharp now you see a sharp signal from an axion conversion, but I have a feeling it's just probably not. Wait, sorry, can you can you say that one more time? Yeah, if you have a big bag star, you, there's the axions filed in our galaxy, those are going to convert axions to radio frequency photons. And so oh yes, stars, yeah. So we stars. we actually have used previous gen. It's our non-primary science tools. Yeah. Is uh, there's multiple ways that an axion field could like impact uh, that we could measure it. So one is yeah, like uh, starlight or microwave sources that have a known polarization. The axion field will rotate that polarization, so they're sort of integrated along the axion density. Um, and then also just like from the CMD to us. Some axion field would produce some amount of polarization rotation. Um, and you could look at uh, sort of modulations of that signal if you made maps that are as a function of time. Um, so there have been already been a number of papers about looking for basically impacts on polarization rotation due to the axion um, mechanism. Yeah. But I don't think that this particular conversion mechanism from the star. Uh, I don't know that, so. Yeah, you know, it's probably not quite enough power for you to see, but it'd be interesting that it's that. You know, just looking at your data for some sharp peak somewhere. And you might throw away those noise if you didn't think it was there. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, like, this is a relatively new thing for us because we usually we just average over years. So people that are looking for transients and not throwing them away as glitches and trying to, like, understand if they have an astrophysical nature. It's totally like kind of a new landscape for us. I think those be a persistent signal at a fairly fixed frequency. Yeah, so you you look for it blazing at some sort of rate. Yeah, you so yeah, you know, the whole star would just be radiating wide waves at a frequency corresponding to the axion mass. That is always going to be happening. It's almost like you know, a hydrogen like an alpha line or something. It's it just be the axion conversion. Frequency and that would be radiating constantly. Nice sharp line. Well, sounds like a new analysis project. Don't do it. You just graduate. Yeah, you mentioned you have some overlap between other experiments. Like, roughly how much is that the case? Um, you, are you referring to when you're when I'm showing the map? Yeah. Um, it's basically a hundred percent overlap with. Uh, yes, I think, and I'm not sure about LSST, but it's a very high because we're basically sighted in the same location, and our goal is to look at as much of the sky as possible, which is basically the same strategy as these optical surveys. Um, so it's like pretty close to 100 percent overlap. Okay, I was wondering too if you had um, some survey that you had maybe like let's say 40 percent overlap with. Can you apply like anything you understand about your detectors to make like a filter for a different sky survey? For analysis. Oh, you mean like overlap with another CMD survey? Yeah, I've never seen. Well, okay, so that's only recently have people been trying to do this for this case of the lens thing, which I was mentioning, where you have like two different instruments that have different um, resolutions, different noise characteristics. And uh, the short end of it is people are still trying to figure it out. Like it's definitely a doable thing, but it's hard. <laughs> um, but I think it's a challenge that people are, are like working on. Yeah. Uh, so, how do you calibrate the relative gain in each antenna pair? Oh, good question. Um, so, there's a lot of calibration steps, but the relative gain is mostly uh, we have, yeah. So, one, one way we can do it, at least for this uh, instrument, with uh, it's different for the different instruments, but in the large aperture telescope, we actually have a um, we have a small source of known temperature that is in a small hole in the secondary mirror that we chop. Okay. And so we can see the amplitude of that chop relative to all of them and then basically flat fill them to each other to normalize them to one another. Yeah. And in the small aperture telescope, there's like many ways to do this. So we have um, we have a, a grid of wires that we rotate in front with this halfway plate that spins mm -hmm. and we know the wire temperature and polarization emission direction. So we can flat field the response of that across the sectors. Um, we also measure planets. 
Um, and we also, with the sensors, we can trace an ID curve, which is basically you can extract the gain of the individual sensor, and you could normalize that as well. So can you get down to, um, let's say, percent level accuracy with those kinds of methods in the next week? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's sub percent level um, gain calibration. Yeah, yeah but, but the, the I, so, so I think the reason I'm asking is just, as you know, Atmosphere fluctuation is a big problem. Yes. For me, that latitude is yes. Yeah. Um, so. That's true. That's true. So, but for us, with at least with sort of our beam and size and our observing strategy, we check this and we'll have to check it again in our experiment. But uh, typically, the gain drifts together with the sense with the different pairs of sensors and they drift. Typically drift linearly. So the gain is proportional to the atmospheric loading slightly. But the way we've corrected this, at least in experiment, in the, like the previous experiment the, at UCSD, was just a, a linear interpolation. And we tried like monitoring it continuously and we found that that was sufficient variation over any, any given observation. But we calibrate relatively frequently, like every hour. Yeah, so. Couple of questions. You showed two kinds of transducers or uh, the antenna collection or focus. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming you install only one of them. <laughs> there, yeah. So the there's no, both are used, but um, uh, the sinuous antennas were used for the low frequency array, so the 27, 39 gigahertz, and then 95 gigahertz and higher frequencies used the horns and uh, with the orbital mode transmission. Just because of some technical reason or? Um, yeah, partially partially because of some technical thing. Yeah. A little bit a little bit because of the expertise of the fabrication houses that were making the different sensor wavelengths. Um, and then a little bit because we wanted this systematic check between the different types of things. And then the other is more fundamental. Uh, you showed a graph of I think it was at the end of the day sensitivity as a function of integration time and the number of detectors. Yeah, yeah. But in the cartoon thing, yeah. Say it. Yeah, no, it's the like, cartoon plot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, the number of detectors, so that's for an assumed area of collection, right? So I am changing the number of detectors, assuming that my optical or microwave aperture is fixed. But if I had a telescope, no, no, I mean, these are bigger apertures that have bigger collecting area, and we're filling that collecting area with more vectors. So the effective throughput of the instrument is higher. Okay, so the that I don't understand, because if I am clear to say that for a given aperture, if I increase the number of detectors, then somehow my sensitivity is really higher. Because you're just you're scanning the same patch of the sky, but with different detectors, and then it's you're getting like this time order data. And then you're binning. It's like how many detector time samples are binned to the same map in the sky? So this the I don't know if that answers your question or not. And then how are you getting more information? The same amount of time. It's not more information. You're just integrating. It's like just raw integration time. Like in a given map ball, map area of the sky, you're just more regularly integrating the same regions of the map. Well, it's because if you don't have a detector somewhere, you're storing that power away. Right? Yeah. yeah. Like you were, you're just not integrating on so that on an app. In fact, the power detector is not just like made it smaller and more of them. It's probably more power out of them. If I'm not focusing on all of these microwaves, no, that's right. It's, it's an image of the slide that's projected on the screen. And so if there's space between the detectors, that's just lost power. Yeah. Yeah, so you fill the detectors up until basically you make the density high enough until the physical detectors become no longer, um, uh, uh, until they become correlated, until you're effectively, the detectors are sampling the same area disks. Okay. And so we've, we've made it that density, and then you just increase, if you increase the focal plane density, you continue scaling um, the. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm.
assume uh, I thought the all the devices are developing a directed trade. I assume it's a drive trade. Yeah, they're all drive trades. Yeah. The operation of the drive trade could have does not increase the uh, does not uh, hold the limit uh, limit of the sensitivity of the sensor. Yeah. So um, we do have a lot of isolation built into the system. So there's the Maybe this there's some standard isolation that you can buy from these uh, mechanical crowd cores, and we added some additional uh, isolation. Um, but we do still see these lines, um, and so. But what it ends up being is that you know you have some scan rate, so like they're relatively narrow features, so they're relatively narrow lines, and so they correspond to losing power in relatively limited number of modes on the sky. Because each mode, if you're scanning at a certain rate, the kind of spatial scale corresponding to a physical peak in your PSU is like some physical scale on the sky. And so if you just notch filter out those lines, um, you lose very few. So we do end up doing that. Or we do think we will have to do that in the near term. Um, the ones that might really hurt us is if they land right where our half weight plate is rotating. But we at least get to choose where we rotate the halfway plate. So we avoid these sorts of collisions with those lines. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry for a lot of questions. <laughs> Your questions are really good. Uh, cool. So uh, I'm just wondering what's the goal of the community if we don't see females in 15 years? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When do you stop? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I mean, for for example, as always targeting um R down to 10 to minus three. Yeah. Right. And that's only scratching the surface of zero density type inflation models. And well, you there's no lower bound. I mean, you can come up with I mean there are some classical models which we've already rolled out, like a lot of the phi squared models, but um the but like the more models we move out, the more we find R 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus, you know, or yeah. So um yeah, there's a practical lower bound, I think, to which we just like couldn't create a more high like the next generation experiment that we're building. I don't think there will be a next next generation experiment after that. That's at least that's targeting home, like exclusively measuring R. Like I think there's many things to do with millimeter wave telescopes. But I'm not sure. Like, there, it's a huge scale. Like, they're basically making the three. If we're making three telescopes. They're making four feet or something of basically the small aperture telescope, and that's how they're getting to the higher sensitivity. And it just becomes kind of you've now reached a scale where it's unclear if it's, there's still benefit. But we'll see what the community thinks. If they <laughs> want to spend the, you know ten trillion dollars. <laughs> I mean, that's the reward of y'all decision <laughs> by then. So, yeah. <laughs> well, on that thing, uh, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? I think we're a little bit over time, but I think that everybody got some really good information out of that. Uh, if that's it, then I want to thank everybody who logged in from the outside and thank everybody here. And once again, let's uh, give it up and back. Thank you, everyone. The last five yards.